In Astonishing Revelations, Christ warns of the devil's temptations and describes the evil one as the enemy of the state. Additionally, St. Bridget receives a shocking symbolic vision of the Church along with its meaning. The Pope, Cardinals, and Prelates are depicted in this startling revelation. Join me for the entirety of these stunning visions of a Church mystic as Virgo Potens presents Prophecies and Revelations of St. Bridget of Sweden. Prophecies and Revelations by St. Bridget Book 4, Chapter 47 The Son of God Speaks If the enemy is battering at the city gates, you should not be like goats that run toward the wall, or like rams that rear themselves up on their hind legs and butt against each other with their horns. Instead, you should be like chickens that see a bird of prey in the sky, aiming to harm them and take refuge beneath the wings of their mother and hide there. They are happy even if they only get hold of a single one of the mother's feathers and take cover there. Who is your enemy if not the devil, who looks maliciously upon every good deed and is wont to batter and agitate the human mind with temptations? Sometimes he batters it with anger and slander, sometimes with impatience and criticism towards God's decisions, whenever things do not turn out as one wishes. Very often he batters and upsets you with innumerable thoughts in order to draw you away from God's service and cast a shadow over your good works before God. Therefore, no matter what temptations you have, you should not abandon your position, nor be like the goats that run up toward the wall, that is, to be hard of heart or to criticize other people's actions in your hearts, since a person who is bad today is often good tomorrow. Rather, you should lower your horns, stand still, and listen, that is, humble yourselves and be fearful, patiently entreating God so that bad beginnings may be changed into a happy ending. Nor should you be like the rams brandishing their horns, that is, paying back insult with insult and adding taunt to taunt. Rather, you should stand steadily on your feet and remain silent, that is, check your passions, so that in your speech and responses you may show forethought and patient forcefulness, because the righteous man overcomes himself and restrains himself even from licit remarks in order to avoid loquacity and offensiveness, when a person is agitated in mind and lets go of everything he feels inside, he seems somehow to have vindicated himself and revealed the instability of his mind. This is the reason why he will be left without a reward, because he was unwilling to be patient for a time. Had he been patient, he would both have won over his offending brother and fitted himself for a greater reward. What do the hen's wings represent if not divine power and wisdom? You see, I am like a hen that powerfully protects from the snares of the devil those chickens that run to me when I call, that is, those who desire the shade of my wings and I summon them to salvation through my wise inspirations. What does the feather represent if not mercy? One who obtains mercy can feel as secure as a chicken sheltered beneath its mother's wings. So, be like the chickens running toward my will. In all temptations and adversities, say both out loud and in your deeds. May God's will be done. For I protect those who trust in me with my power. I refresh them with my mercy. I hold them with my patience. I visit them with my solace. I enlighten them with my wisdom. I reward them a hundredfold with my love. The Son of God's Words to St. Bridget 
about a king and how he should work to increase God's honor and love for souls, and about his sentencing if he fails to do so. Chapter 48 The Son of God Speaks If this man wishes to honor me, let him first work to reduce my dishonor and increase my honor. My dishonor consists in the contempt shown for the commandments that I have commanded and the words that I have personally spoken, which are completely disregarded by almost everyone. If he wishes to love me, then let him from now on show greater charity toward all souls, for whom I opened up heaven with my heart's blood. If he longs to rest with God more than to enlarge his inheritance, then he will surely find greater desire as well as help from God in order to win back that place, Jerusalem, where my dead body lay. Tell him, you who are hearing this, I, God, allowed him to be crowned king. This is why it is especially his duty to follow my will and to love and honor me above all things. If he fails to do so, his days will be cut short. Moreover, those people who are emotionally attached to him will be painfully separated from him, and his kingdom will be divided into several parts. St. Bridget's Symbolic Vision of the Church, its explanation, which concerns the moderation and attitude that the Pope ought to maintain regarding his own person and regarding the cardinals and other prelates of Holy Mother Church, and especially about the attitude of humility. Chapter 49 It seemed to a certain person that she was in a large chancel, and a great shining sun appeared. There were two pulpits, as it were, in the chancel, one to the right and the other to the left, with a long space intervening between them and the sun. Two rays of the sun fell upon the pulpits. Then a voice was heard from the pulpit on the left side, saying, Hail, Eternal King, Creator and Redeemer, and Just Judge! Behold, your vicar, who is seated on your chair in the world, has now brought his chair back to its ancient and earlier place, where sat the first Pope, Peter, Prince of the Apostles. A voice from the pulpit on the right replied, saying, How can he enter into the Holy Church, when the barrels of the door hinges are full of rust and dirt. This is why the doors are inclining toward the ground, because there is no room in the barrels to receive the hinge pins that should be supporting the doors. The pins have been completely bent outward, and are not at all curved in such a way as to hold the doors in place. The floor is all dug up and has been converted into pits as deep as bottomless wells. The ceiling is smeared with pitch and burning with sulfurous flames, dripping down like dense rain. Thick black fumes arising from the pits and the dripping of the ceiling have stained all the walls and made their color as ugly to look at as gory blood and pus. It is therefore not fitting for God's friend to have his dwelling in such a temple. The voice from the left replied, saying, Give a spiritual explanation of what you have described physically. The other voice then said, The Pope is symbolized and represented by the doors. The barrels of the door hinges signify humility. This should be empty of all pride, so that nothing is to be seen there except what pertains to the humble office of pontiff, just as the barrel should be completely empty of any rust. However, the barrels, that is, the insignia of humility, are now so full of excess and wealth and resources, kept for no other purpose than pride, that nothing seems humble, since all his humility has been converted into worldly pomp, Therefore, it is not surprising that the Pope, represented by the doors, is inclining toward worldliness, 
as symbolized by the rust and dirt. Accordingly, let the Pope begin with true humility in himself. First of all, in his trappings, his clothes, his gold, silver, and vessels of silver, his horses and other equipment, getting rid of everything but what is necessary, and donating the rest to the poor, and, especially, to those whom he knows to be friends of God. Let him then organize his entourage with moderation, and keep only those servants needed to protect him. Although it is in God's hands to call him to judgment, Still, it is only right for him to have servants both in order to strengthen the cause of justice, and so that he can humble those who rebel against God and against the holy customs of the church. The hinge pins attached to the doors represent the cardinals, who have been bent outward and stretched as far as possible toward all pride, greed, and physical pleasure. This is why the Pope should take a hammer and tongs in hand, and bend the hinges to his will, by not letting them have more clothes, servants, and equipment than necessity and utility require. Let him bend them with the tongs, that is, with his soothing words, and divine counsel, and fatherly love. Then, if they refuse to obey, he should take the hammer and display severity toward them, doing with them whatever lies in his power and does not go against justice, until they are bent to his will. The floor represents the bishops and the secular clergy, whose greed is bottomless. From their pride and luxurious way of living comes the fumes that make all the angels in heaven and God's friends on earth shun them. The Pope can improve the situation greatly by allowing them to have only what they need and nothing superfluous, and he should order each bishop to watch over the ways of his own clergy. Anyone who refuses to mend his ways and live continently should be stripped of his prebends, because God would rather not have a mass said in a given place than let a whorish hand touch the body of God. St. Bridget's unfathomable vision of the judgment of a multitude of persons still in life, in which she heard, If people would rectify their sins, I too will lighten their sentence. Chapter 50 It seemed to me as though a king was seated on a judgment seat, and each living person stood before him. Each person had two beings standing next to him, one of whom appeared like an armed soldier, the other like a black Ethiopian. A pulpit stood before the judgment seat. On it lay a book, arranged in the same way as I saw earlier when I saw three kings standing before him. It seemed to me that the whole world was standing before the pulpit. Then I heard the judge saying to the armed soldier, Call those whom you have served with love. Those who were named fell down immediately. Some of them lay there for a longer while, others for a shorter, before their souls were separated from their bodies. I am unable to grasp everything I heard and saw then, for I heard the sentences of many people still living, but who will soon be called. However, the following was said to me by the judge. If people would rectify their sins... I, too, will lighten their sentence. Then I saw many people being sentenced, some to purgatory, others to everlasting woe. St. Bridget's admirable and terrible vision about a soul led before the judge, and about the arguments of God and the book's judgment against the soul, and the soul's evidence against herself and about the various astounding punishments inflicted on her in purgatory. Chapter 51 It seemed that I saw a soul being led to the judge by the soldier and the Ethiopian whom I had seen earlier. It was said to me, What you now see all took place in regard to that soul when she was released from the body. Once the soul had been escorted into the presence of the judge, 
she stood there alone, no longer in the hands of either of her escorts. She stood there naked and sorrowful, not knowing to what place she would come. It seemed to me, then, that every word in the book gave its own answer to each and every thing the soul was saying. In the hearing of the judge and of the entire host, the armed soldier spoke first, saying, It is not right to bring up as a reproach against this soul the sins for which she has made reparation in confession. I beheld all this, but realized then, quite well, that the soldier who was speaking already had knowledge of everything in God, but spoke so that I would understand. A reply then came from the Book of Justice. Although this soul did perform penance, it was not accompanied by a contrition or true satisfaction proportionate to her great sins. She should therefore suffer now for those sins for which she did not make reparation when she was able. When this was said, the soul began to weep so violently that it was as though she had broken down completely, and yet through her tears could be seen, not a sound could be heard. Then the king said to the soul, Let your conscience now declare those sins that were not accompanied by a proportionate satisfaction. Then the soul raised her voice with such force that it was as though it could be heard throughout the whole world. She said, Woe is me that I did not act according to God's commands, which I heard and knew. Then she added in self-accusation, I did not fear God's judgment. The book replied to her, You must therefore now fear the devil. Right away the soul began to fear and tremble, as if she were melting away completely, and she said, I had almost no love for God. That is why I did so little good. An immediate reply was made to her from the book. That is why it is just for you to approach closer to the devil than to God, because the devil lured and enticed you to himself with his temptations. The soul replied, I understand now that everything I did was done on the promptings of the devil. A reply was made from the book. Justice dictates that it is the devil's right to repay your accomplishments with pain and punishment. The soul said, From head to heel there was nothing I did not dress with pride. Some of my vain and proud manners I invented myself. Others I just followed according to the custom of my native land. I washed my hands and face, not only in order to be clean, but also to be called beautiful by men. A reply was made from the book. Justice says that it is the devil's right to repay you for what you have earned, since you dressed and adorned yourself as he inspired and told you to do. The soul said again, my mouth was often open for body talk, because I wanted to please others, and my heart longed for all those things provided it did not result in worldly disgrace or disapproval. A reply was made from the book. That is why your tongue must be drawn out and stretched and your teeth bent in, and all the things you must detest will be set before you, and all the things you like will be taken away from you. The soul said, I enjoyed it immensely when many people took after my example and noticed what I did and copied my manners. A reply was made from the book. Hence, it is just that everyone caught in the sin for which you are about to be punished should also suffer the same punishment and be brought to you. Then your pain will be increased each time someone comes who copied your fashions. After these words, it seemed to me as though a chain was wound about her head like a crown, and then tightened so hard that the front and back of her head were joined together. Her eyes fell out of their sockets and dangled by their roots at her cheeks. Her hair looked like it had been scorched by flames, and her brains were shattered and flowed out through her nostrils and ears. Her tongue was stretched out and her teeth pressed in. 
Her arms were twisted like ropes, and their bones broke. Her hands, with their skin peeled off, were fastened to her throat. Her breast and belly were bound so hard with her back that her ribs were broken, and her heart spilled out together with all her entrails. Her thighs dangled at her flanks, and their broken bones were being pulled out just like a thin thread is used to thread a needle. After this sight, the Ethiopian replied, O judge, the soul's sins have now been punished according to justice. Now join the two of us, this soul and mine, so that we may never be separated. But the armed soldier replied, Here, judge, you who know all things. It concerns you now to hear the last thought and feeling that this soul had at the end of her life. At the very last moment, she had the following thought. Oh, if God would only give me enough life, I would gladly make reparation for my sins, and serve him all the rest of my lifetime, and never more offend him. O oh, judge, such were her last thoughts and wishes. Remember too, Lord, that this person did not live long enough to acquire a fully understanding conscience. Therefore, Lord, think of her youth and treat her mercifully. A reply was then made from the Book of Justice. Last thoughts such as these do not deserve hell. Then the judge said, Because of my passion, let heaven be opened up for this soul once she has undergone purgation for her sins for as much time as she is bound to suffer unless she receives assistance from the good works of others still alive. Explanation This woman made a vow of virginity in the presence of a priest, and then married later on. She died giving birth. Thanks for stopping by and watching my video to the end. Please hit the like button and subscribe to this channel. Doing so really helps me to reach more souls. If you enjoyed this video, or think that this work may be helpful for others, please consider supporting me through Patreon. Or, if you would prefer making a one-time contribution, just click on the Super Thanks icon below the video title. Your generous support helps to keep this channel going. To everyone who watches my videos and or supports me, I offer my sincere gratitude. May God bless you.